going to do a mock-up of a design. I've been working on different images for my two nieces, one of them who wants a pink fish and the other one who wants a snake. So I was trying to figure out how I was going to do a pink fish and a snake together and so on. And when I did a bunch of different sample images of the snake, they like the one of the snake and then raft in the water. And the fishes are swimming in the water, so that seemed like an ideal way to get a fish and a snake together in one sort of image. So I'm going to do a small painting to do some testing of the idea. Now, you might think that I have oodles of colors over here, but as it turns out, even though I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight shades of red across here, including a rose, I don't have anything that creates a nice pink in terms of what one of my nieces wanted to have for a pink color. So I had to go and order an actual <laughs> pink color. So let me just grab that so you can take a look. So technically this is called red purple. But it is the kind of pink color that they were aiming for. So if I end up liking it, then I'll end up pulling one of these colors out from here to be able to put in the pink one instead. And watercolors are eternal in the sense that uh, they come out of the tube wet, you put them in here, and then they slowly dry, and then you just make them wet again to start using them. So they're not like acrylics or oil paints where when they dry, then they become unusable. So this pan, you know, I wet it when I'm using it, it dries out when I'm storing it, and then I just wet it again. So it's uh, very economical. You are never wasting anything. Everything is always useful somehow. And even these colors on here, I can just wet them and start using them again. So where am I going to put this? Let's make a little spot over here. It's clear. So again, to clear this out, I just wet it and then drag the color somewhere else. I'll just scrub out that last little bit so that we don't have grays in our pink. Got a clear spot there. Right, got a little dollop of the pink purple color. All right, so the first step in doing this is to sketch it out. So again, think about the rule of thirds. Imagine that this is divided up into a third horizontally, and into thirds vertically, and try not to put something necessarily right in the middle, although I have paintings around here. I think I might have already sent them off to their destinations. But I've had a painting or two where the thing was just right in the center of the screen. And it's okay to do that sometimes. So just try different things and see how they balance out. But it's, it's good to also think about those intersections of the third lines and to put things there because the eye is just naturally drawn there and it creates a visually pleasing effect. So if we put the snake across the top third, so we'll just sketch lightly that top third and say that that is the top of the water. All right, so then we have the snake up here. All right, so we're making a floating rubber raft. So we'll do the raft first. And the raft has a back. 
And again, the challenge is remember that there's going to be a mat, so you don't want to get too close to the edge up here because that's where the mat's going to go to cover it up. So I'm going to have the snake dangling down here. Coming up here, a little too far. Coming up here. Alright, the snake head. Give him a book to read. Gorilla up the back side. The thing. And again, now that I'm sort of compressing this all, I need to put it close enough to him that it doesn't go off the edge. It's sort of close to the edge there. And it'll just be right at the edge. See, on one hand I could have made him smaller, but on the other hand I don't want him to be too tiny because he is one of the main focal points of the image. Alright, so we got the snake in his uh, little thing. Hey John, it's good to see you. John, this is the one we did first. There's the mouse and the baby mouse and the ladybug. Put that down a little. Now you can sort of see that. Alright, so now we have a fish. They said she liked a spiky fish. I have to figure out what kind of a spiky fish I could draw. So let me start with the general shape. I'm going to think about the way eyes flow through the picture. And again, thinking about the thirds, this shape up here is up here in the top left third, and then to match it, we could create a shape down here in the bottom right third. So again, if you think about the two thirds this way, and then a third this way, it goes through the center of this fish we're drawing. Fishy tail. Spiky. My fish is spiky. Give it a big eye. I like big eyes. Spiky. Spiky fish. The fish has spikes. Do something like this. It's 
that looks spiky to you guys. Ooh, sort of spiky. Let's see what she thinks about this. If she comes back and says, that is way too spiky. But that's part of the process of doing this sort of thing. You try something, you experiment. See what they say. Alright, well that looks reasonably spiky, <laughs> I would say. Alright, give it some sort of a thing here. So we've got snake reading a book, we've got spiky fish, and an eyeball. Alright, so once we've mapped out, uh, I think I need to fix this umbrella. Keep looking at the umbrella and keep saying it's a little off balance. And that's part of the point of drawing things in pencil first. So that you get a sense of anything that you want to fix before you go solidifying it in ink. Alright. I think we'll call that ready. Alright, next comes the pen stage. We're going to draw this out. I will start down with this spiky fish. So when you're drawing with the pen, you don't have to exactly follow the pencil marks. You can always erase out the parts that you don't end up using with the pencil. It's giving you a starting point. With that being said, I wouldn't stray too far from the pencil. If you wanted to try out a different idea, I would try it with the pencil to see how it works. Because the pen can't be erased. Spiky fish it is. We'll see if I made this too spiky. Hey guys. fish. Right, work on the snake. Float. Pillow. 
the road back. Okie doke. Now, do the surface of the water. Alright, so I think we've got all the main details of the seam inked out. So we'll just give it a moment to dry because while you might think of pen as going on dry, it actually is a little bit wet while it is flowing out of your pen. So we're just going to ink on the watercolor spots. And we'll put in a couple of All right, so this should be dry now. So start with the backgrounds. And wet on wet is the perfect technique here because you want a soft, gentle background for the sky and for the water. So we will make the water a nice turquoise blue. Uh, which of these two do I like? I will use this one. The cerulean blue. So I said I was going to do wet on wet, and then I started painting <laughs> with the paint, but that's okay. It'll all blend. And you can see there's a little bit of green down in the bottom here from the previous painting where it wrapped around and that tends to happen when you have a sketchbook that sometimes the paint from a previous page gets around the edge of it onto the next page and that's all right. The idea with these is to make quick sketches to get some practice in to test out ideas, to be relaxed, and low stress. So again, this is going to dry fairly quickly. So what I'm going to do is do the left-hand side of this, and that might dry a little bit while I'm working on the right-hand side, but that's all right. Joke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
tail here. So now that the left side is done, I'm going to start painting in the water on the right side. And the left side is starting to dry, but that's okay because I'm not too concerned about the left side of the painting touching the right side of the painting at the far reaches, as long as they keep this middle area wet so that they merge in, then that's the important part. Get in amongst all these spiky things. around all the little spiky parts and now to get some more color to get this to spread out so if I start here in the middle area make sure that those colors blend so that it doesn't look like there's a giant line between the left side and the right side This is already starting to dry a little because you can see how I brush the edges. And the speed at which it dries depends in part on how humid your area is. So it could be on a very dry day, which it is right now, even though we have humidifiers running in the house, but this will dry fairly quickly, so you need to work fairly quickly to keep everything flowing and merging together. Again, like we talked before, the paper is going to curl a little and mount in a little, and that's all right. It's just the way watercolor paper works. Right, so it's got this organic feel to it that colors are all shading in different areas. That's yeah, good, it gives it a sense that it's a real natural ocean scene. And again, remember everything's going to dry lighter, so if you end up wanting to go over with a second layer or a third layer, that is fine and natural. Oh, there's a little hole in there. Alrighty, I think I might want this area to be a little more colored in. I think we've got a general sense of it. Alright, so next I'm going to work on the sky. And I need to be careful with the sky because a lot of this area up here is still wet. 
and if the wet of the sky touches the wet of the water, then the two of them could accidentally merge into each other. Because if I got the blue of the sky up down here, it could get drawn into the wetness of the water area. So, first I need a different color blue for the sky. Because I want the two of them to stand out from each other. <coughs> Sorry. I think I'm going to go with phthalo blue, which is this one over here at the end. Alright, so we're going to make that area wet with clear water. But I'm not going to go right down up against... down up. <laughs> I'm not going to go right down to the edge of the water right now. I will do that area last to try to give that area time to dry. But there's plenty else in here for me to work on. Alright, we'll see how that is a different type of blue. See how it's spreading out towards <laughs> the water? But I did not paint it wet all the way down to the water level. So it will not spread and touch. So I'll be very careful when I get down that far. But there are plenty of things for me to work on up here where yeah, I get to that point. And these areas of light and dark up here, they make it seem like it's got little patches of clouds, which is a nice effect. And it just happens naturally without you having to draw in individual clouds, which you could if you really want to. Alright, so I'm going to be very careful now. I'm going right along the edge of those waves without touching the water layer so that it does not suck the water layer up into the sky. Alright, so far so good. Okay, well, let's see over here. No, 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 see it went into the water. I'll have to rescue that in a second. Alright, so <laughs> rinse and dry the brush. Luckily the colors aren't too far separated. So see how that gets sucked right up? action of the water draws paint into it. And that's good when you're doing a related area like that. It's a little less good if you happen to touch two different areas together. It draws the wrong color out into a space you are working on. dry enough that it's safer to touch up these little areas now. It's a little dark. Try to get in here around his little face. Remember, it's going to dry later. And 
if you really need to, you can usually scrub out some of the color to lighten it up. Alright, so now I just got water and I'm spreading out this blue so that it's a little smoother across the space. I don't want there to be too dark of an area down in here. It's sort of pooling down there because of the bend in the paper that formed. Alright, there we go. Trying to make it a little more consistent across the sky space. It's all the same color of blue, but depending on how dark or light you make it, there's different appearances. That is looking good so far. Alright, pink of the fish. Get my brush nice and clean again. Now while this is pinker, it's almost a little purplier. I wonder if I take that mix it with a little red. Let's find out. Let's put it in the red area. And that ends up with more of a rose color. What happens if I mix it? a little over here and mix it with a little yellow. And that also goes towards more of a rose color. And I'll go with that color and see what they think. And if not, then I will just have to order another pink. Or I think I have some pan watercolors upstairs that have an actual bright pink color. Let's see what they think. Yeah, I see it's looking more purple to me. More of a purple than a pink. No, when you make it light, it's more of like a purpley color to me than a pink color. It's just odd that they don't really have a pink in this particular set of watercolors that I was looking at. This was the closest that they got. Even when I try to make it very light just to see. This is still a purpley color. And it's sort of getting pink, you think? On that tail end. And I'm not 
not sure. Tucker spikes. When it gets darker, it definitely gets purplier looking. Putting it on very thick to cause this pointy area to be darker and more saturated in color. is a tricky thing. The way people perceive colors can be very individual. And someone might say they like pink, but there might be a particular shade of pink that they like, and they might not like other shades of pink. That's why it's good to make little practice images. See what someone thinks. Another practice image until you narrow in on what they're interested in. Yeah, I'd love to see the things that you're working on. I like doing a painting a day. Let's me keep trying out new ideas and practicing. Getting feedback on what works. And the more that you talk to other artists, the more that you get ideas for your own things and get ideas for techniques to try and so on. I find painting to be very relaxing and meditative. You're just thinking about the colors and the shapes and so on. And for a little while, everything else just sort of falls away. And it's good for the brain to be able to get into that state of calm, focus, and energy. It's good for pretty much everything else you do. Training the brain to be able to focus and concentrate. Of course, it's also good to take regular breaks. So every hour or so, get up and stretch. Stay hydrated. Alright. We have the spiky fish. Here. 
this orange is still not coming up very bright. I think this orange is going to be one of those colors that you have to go over a couple times to really get the color to stand out. Blue and orange is a pretty classic color combination. The orange stands out fairly nicely against a blue. Technically, this is actually an orange yellow. And I was thinking about making the float yellow. Like we said before, it's good to think about the colors you're going to use and how the colors will go together and be visible against each other. So I think I'll do a yellow. Yellow. Yellow float. Just have to be careful with the orange. Snake still being wet. Oh, there it goes. Exactly what I was worried about. Luckily, the orange is nice and light. So even if it does leach a little into the yellow float, won't be too awful. Give that a chance to dry a little so that we don't get more of this whole <laughs> yellow orange mingling stuff that we had going on. One hand, I could put more pink purple in there. I think I want to leave the tail light so that she can see how it turns out when it's light, but I still think that that's going to be too purpley. But we're, we're hoping for something a little pinker. So that's part of this process, is to play and learn. Let's get a little brown in there for the book. I should be able to get the book in without touching any of the other areas. But I don't think I can get the really little tip part. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that's what I get for wasting racing. You have to let things dry. If you don't let things dry, then things get drawn into other wet areas where they do not belong. I think that's the closest we can get <laughs> before things start all merging into each other again. I 
Okay, so I think I need to let that dry. I may be able to put another layer of the orange in. If I keep it reasonably dry. Give it a brighter orange color. It's just not getting very bright. a little brighter. Okay. Just want to be very careful over here where the wet colors are right up against each other. And you can see it. Drifting the color down into the wet areas. Yep, yep, it's going right out into that yellow back. Alright, I need to let it dry. I really like to work quick. There are times that a little patience is called for <laughs> if you want to keep the colors separate from each other. Alright, so we've got the starting point for this thing. But now we need to let that dry a bit so that it can get another layer on it without all the colors running together. All right, so we'll just put that there for a second. Go back. This is more dry now, so we might be able to put another layer of the orange in. You can see how the orange is getting darker and more saturated, the more layers that we're putting onto it. Hopefully it stays... Oh, it's still trying to drift a little into that back cushion. Fix that in a second. Should be able to put a little more yellow into the top area of the umbrella, since that's an entirely separate little object. There we go. Alright, I won't touch the rest of that for now, because it's wet, and it will pull the color into the other area. So we'll let that try. <laughs> we'll let. Yeah, we can put that up there. But let's see. It feels reasonably dry for me to add in. Another layer of yellow to the main part of the float. 
to brighten that yellow up a bit. Hopefully that is all reasonably dry now. seems to be happening nicely. Alright, I actually want to make the umbrella stock brown, but now I've once again put some more yellow right next to it, so it's dangerous to paint wet right next to something else that is wet. So we'll just reinforce the brown in the top dot for now. And catch the little edges of the book. Because even the book, I can't get too close to that yellow that I just painted. Because it might get sucked in there. bottom swoop of the snake body a little oranger but again because that middle part is yellow and we just added some yellow to that I can't get too close to the yellow because the color could easily get sucked in there so I'll just stay down in this lower area where it is not as risky Alright, I think his tail area down here is nicely darker yellow. Or orange, I mean. <laughs> darker orange. Alright. So there's a hair or two in there now, but I will deal with those later. Alright, so now that needs to dry. I can't touch the rest of it until those pieces dry. So let me know if you have any questions at all about pen and ink watercolor. About how the process works. I'm using quite inexpensive paints here so you don't need to spend a lot of money. You can buy an inexpensive brush and most of the time I just use one brush so you don't need lots and lots of different excuse me brushes. <laughs> you can buy a batch of inexpensive watercolor paints. I buy a tube kit you know like with 12 colors or something and I just squish them into this thing and they last forever so it's a very frugal kind of art. You can put them away, let them sit there for a couple months, pull them out, just get them wet again and they will work again fine. And uh, the only thing that you really end up paying for is the paper. And it, it's good to use an actual watercolor paper, not a printer paper, because even the watercolor paper tends to buckle and curl. Printer paper we would soak right through and have various problems. But you should be able to find watercolor paper inexpensively at job lot, job lot or other discount stores. And just buy them in bulk and practice and practice. So let me know if you have any questions. Have a great afternoon. And